we had a three-part roundtable conversation that some of the challenges you may be experiencing, you're no different than me. There is someone there that looks like me, like representation matters. Having come from a time where I was the only black person in the building till today where we've got diversity unlike we've had in the past, it's exciting. I am so excited to be here with these beautiful young ladies today for the Black History Month Roundtable, and I would love to have each one of you introduce yourselves. I'll start with you, Brianna. Yes, I'm Brianna. I'm a group sales account executive. So I joined the team back in January 2020. My primary focus is working with companies and organizations here across Tennessee and coming out and enjoying experience here at, at Nissan Stadium with the Tennessee Titans, whether that be for company purposes, client, employee entertainment, or just spending time with loved ones here at our building. So that's our, my primary focus. And what what is your journey to get here before joining the organization? Yeah, so I, I always knew I wanted to work in sports, just didn't quite know how I was gonna go about that, right? So during undergrad, I took an opportunity to be an operations assistant, did that, really loved it. That kind of solidified my passion of man, you know, I'm addicted to this. I'm addicted to being in sports. So after that, I took an internship with a, another NFL organization for one season. And then January 2020, my first time in Nashville, I, I applied to, to join this team and the rest is history. Love having you. Yeah. What about you, Jahari? Well, uh, so I am, like I said, director of Titans Foundation and community programs. So everything I do, my role is centered around community impact and how the Titans show up in our community on a local level, but also on a statewide level, um, and also looking at all of our NFL league initiatives when it comes to our uh, corporate so social responsibility. Um, our foundation is, 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 plays a huge impact and a huge role in how we show up for our fans, how we show up for youth and families. And so I have the privilege of being able uh, to connect the dots and really find opportunities for us to go deeper and wider um, in the community. I have a, a, a long history <laughs> in nonprofit and community work. So prior to joining the Titans, I spent about 20 years in the nonprofit sector. Um, and so I, I never imagined myself working for an NFL franchise team, but I love being able uh, to connect the dots for that social responsibility piece and really giving uh, companies and organizations like the Tennessee Titans um, a chance to just show up for their neighbors. Love it, love it. Valeria? What I do for the Titans is um, I do all legal and risk management with the focus um, primarily on transactional work. So all of our event agreements, um, all of our uh, revenue generating agreements, our sponsorship agreements, that's primarily my area. Um, I would say over the past few months, I've kind of really served in the capacity of, of a generalist. Mm -hmm. And so it's just anything that any of our 25 um, departments, our business units need any help with, um, whether it is business advisory, um, getting advice on like how to have these conversations with partners or clients um, to anticipate any risk before entering into a deal and then on the back end like reviewing um, contractual languages to ensure that the company is protected from a legal perspective. Um, before coming to the Titans, I worked for the NFL for a few years, which was completely different. I did not work as an attorney, but I did have some type of legal capacity. I worked in football operations and I represented the NFL against players um, for on-field violation. And so when I worked a few games on the Titans, I worked about three games last season. And when I seen the job opening, I was like, you know what? This is an opportunity <laughs> that I can't miss. And I took a leap of faith and I'm here now. I am so glad I get like goosebumps thinking about it. <laughs> to be sitting at the table with like three beautiful black women, um, having been in the position where I was the only black woman for I won't say how long I've been here, but a whole lot of years. You're like, only 23. Because I'm only 23. Right. And I started, you, started, you started at three years old. Yeah, yeah. I was three. Mm -hmm. And so then there was like, it was the first black child and black one. No. <laughs> but it feels so good, right? It feels so good to be sitting at this table. And there are others in the building that aren't necessarily sitting here. But to have someone that you can connect with. Um, and it, it's, it's natural, right? Yeah. And so... Um, 
just talk a little bit about how it feels, and anybody can jump in, how it feels to not just be a black woman, but a woman in an industry that's dominated pr primarily by men and what that feels like and how you navigate that. And, you know, just, just coming from that perspective. I mean, it's challenging, right? Um, I think we all three can agree on that. There's times where maybe I feel like being a woman and being a minority woman at that, I'm afraid to maybe be vocal if, if times are challenging or I might not agree with something. And it's a little um, nerve wracking to allow yourself to be vulnerable in that, in that capacity. But I will say to your point, Tina, about you know us three at this table, uh, yourself included, and then all the women at our organization that are not here, I mean, Y'all are trailblazers. I'm, I'm young in my career, but to be able to say, hey, there's, you know, Tina, I knew a Tina that did this. I knew a Jahari that, that did that. You know, Valeria reminds me of this. And then to look at myself and be like, okay, my dreams aren't too big and my aspirations aren't too far. And so to be able to connect the dots on that, I think speaks, speaks volumes about where we are right now at this table. I just, you know, hearing you talk about that brings tears. It, it makes me really emotional because I will honestly say that in my career, oftentimes I didn't have someone that I could go to right. that understood some of the challenges I had. And that was so on top of being frustrated about what was happening or what you were dealing with, there was a second level of frustration that there was no one in your circle of influence that could help navigate that situation. And so I appreciate being called a trailblazer because oftentimes <laughs> you don't see yourself in that light. You just, you go to work to do a job and to do it yeah. well, right? Yeah, but exactly. when there is an opportunity to, to help bring somebody up, I think that's what we all have, right? We all have that responsibility to mm -hmm. bring somebody behind us up to help them get to wherever it is they want to go in their journey. So I, I, I really yeah, appreciate that. that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, tacking on to Brianna's comment, I mean, it's, it's, one thing that I really appreciated about coming into this organization is that, you know, of course, we are all minority women. Um, I'm a mother as well. And so when I thought about taking this job, I was really nervous because it is a male dominated industry. And I was really nervous about if being a mother, being a working mother at that, if there would be the same type of flexibility, the same type of grace, all the things that you think about, Tina, you're a mom, you, you know, and you, and you, Josiah, like, came through the ranks with you. But thinking, yeah. <laughs> but thinking about, like, if that is something that I'm going to have to worry about, and I, I was thrilled and just so grateful that my first week when I walked in and when I started, you know, I already had a relationship with Tina, but to see, you know, Tina continue to remind me, like, we're a family friendly workplace. Like, you can do this. Um, I shared this story with Valeria and Shannon that my first week, you know, you're going around to everyone's office and you're kind of introducing yourself, you're saying hello. And I felt so comfortable walking into Shannon's office because she had a picture of her kids <laughs> on the wall. And that was the first office. She was the first office that I really saw where she really just showcased her kids and showcased like I am a working mother. And so um, it does become when you're looking around the room, you kind of are able to just make these kind of subtle eye contact moments of like, I got you. Right, right. <laughs> We're in this together. I feel you, girl. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, feel you. I feel you. And I love that, you know, if I'm having a stressful day or if I'm having just a day where I need to just let loose and, and just, you know, that I can call on some of the women that look like me in this workplace and that I know I have multiple women who look like me in this workplace and who can share in some of the sentiment and the experiences that, that we go through yeah. as working women. I, I think for me, if I'm being honest, it's like fighting this imposter syndrome, right? right. Mm -hmm. Because it's like you're in this role and you're in this position and you're in this industry and you mm -hmm. fulfill in a capacity that traditionally and historically did not look like you. And right. so constantly you're walking into your offices, you're walking into like the day trying to tackle on the roles and the responsibilities and you're questioning and you're having insecurities like, am I fit for this role? <laughs> like, I don't, I haven't seen anyone to come before me. And and so that adds on another level of challenging because then, you know, as trailblazers, we're kind of really set in that.
that position to be responsible for the next class of women that's going to come in. Um, and so I, I just appreciate the camaraderie and, and the family that I have here. There are times I'll, I'll go to y'all office and I'll, <laughs> I'll take about 20 minutes. <laughs> I can't get my work done because of you. I'm going to work from home because yeah, you won't leave. And I, I need someone to vent to. Yeah. Like, because I'm dealing with problems, everyone's issues, everyone's contracts day in and day out. And it's different different topics, different groups, different peoples, and different issues right after the other. And so sometimes the person that's carrying the weight of the organization needs somebody to, you know, to talk to. And you ladies have been that and other ladies throughout the building. And so... I appreciate that while we are women working in a male dominated field that we are there, we show up for each other and we are available to assist and we meet each other right where we are. And we're here because we're supposed to be here. Absolutely. Right. There was a, I was um, many years ago when I worked in a different department, I had gone to one of the league meetings where everyone comes from around the league and I was the only woman there, right? Black or white, only woman, right? And so they went to do a social outing after our meeting and they had um, golf outing for all the guys and when I was looking for my name I didn't see anything and I finally went up to the organizer and I and I said well where is mine they said oh we've planned a spa day for you <laughs> I mean, I'll take a spa day yeah, I, I, I want the spa day and, and the opportunity yeah, to golf yes. because I'm not here at, like I want people to see me as someone who is deserving of the space right. not here because I check a box. Yes. Not here because they need to check a woman box or here because they need to check a black box, but here right. because I deserve to be here. Mm -hmm. So when you think about like being deserving of that, oftentimes people, young people see you and see you as arrived. You are right. here and here and here. Like they don't see the, the hard yeah. mm -hmm. times and things that you went through to yeah. get here. Um, Talk a little bit about some of that adversity and how you handled it and what you learned through that process. Still handling it. <laughs> Look, I, I can say this uh, transparently. Uh, I failed and I failed miserably throughout the course of my career. When I tried to get into law school, I did not get in the first time. I did My score was not high enough. And I knew then I was like, maybe it's not meant for me to be a lawyer. And then I took two years and then got into law school. And then when I graduated law school, then was my, my battle with passing the bar. I took sick and so it took a few years for me to get back on track and pass the bar. And then right whenever I get you know into the career, then I graduated law school at a time where it's like the economy was like literally going through a recession and so it was for everyone to find a job and then that question came like is it meant for me to be a, a, a lawyer and so how I sustain that is just like keeping that vision in front of me um, and knowing that is attainable and knowing that it is okay to fail and not giving up um, being open to pivot um, like I said before I came here I was in a non-lawyer role so you have a person who is licensed to practice law, but is not practice, practicing law. So being open to pivot whenever the opportunity that presents itself is not ready for you, but you are, mm -hmm. um, and just extending yourself enough grace to know this is my end goal, this is what I need to do to get there, but I know it may take a little while longer, it may take a little more effort than normal, but to still keep that in front of you. Yeah. I mean, there's been several conversations throughout my career where I'm expressing interests that I have in, in sports and and careers and jobs and just things of that nature and literally having men tell me oh women can't do that yeah. or or that's not made for a woman to do mm -hmm. and so i i see as you know the course of the past couple years women are doing these you know groundbreaking things and opportunities and in my head that's that's fuel to the fire it's like oh i remember when someone told me that wasn't meant for a woman and look at this girl now look at her she is rocking it and so it it makes me take a step back when there's been times where i'm like oh maybe i feel this way because i'm a woman or maybe this is why i was given this task and this role um i, I alluded to those things that i heard earlier on but now that i see just the growth it keeps me going yeah, it, yeah. it keeps me you know like no one's gonna tell me I'm not qualified to do something. Yeah. Um, I, and to your point, checking a box or hitting a quota, right. Right. I want, you know, women to just get the job because they're the most qualified. Like, you know, all power to having women in roles. Love to see that. I'm the biggest advocate as we all are for those. But, you know, 
some of these opportunities have granted people saying, oh, she just got it because she's a woman. Yeah. And it's, no, she got it because she's she the best the person right. for the job, right. so. Yeah. I used to say, it was funny, I used to say, I'm going to take one for the team. If I got to be the only black in the building, then I'll, I'll, I'll rep represent it. us well. Amen. But I remember when you talk about um, being in places where they, they felt like or they told you that it wasn't the right position for a woman. Like, I've experienced that personally. I know when I was interested, when I started working with the organization and I learned all the facets of the organization, and one I was really interested in was player development. Now it's player engagement and I expressed interest and I was always told no. Nope, mm -hmm. can't do that, nope, can't do that. And one particular instance, the position became available and I went to the hiring manager and said, I really want this job. Mm -hmm. And they appeased me and interviewed me and asked me to go downstairs and bring somebody else up and I did it. Unbeknownst to me, two minutes later, they introduced that person, a male, as the director of player development. Yeah. And so in that moment, I'm like, damn, sorry. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's just us. <laughs> it's just us. It's just us. <laughs> I'm like, that was A, a slap in the face because I have to work with this person. Yeah. B, I need to really stop and think what's important to me. Mm -hmm. And if I, if, is this the place I'm supposed to be? Like, right. am I supposed to be here? Because I really thought I was prepared. But what I learned is the value in losing, right? There was yeah. so much lesson in losing. I had so many opportunities to learn so much more that what I learned from that is I wasn't ready then. Yeah. And so by taking that step back and reevaluating what was important in my life, five years later, the team called me. I didn't ask them. They came to me and said, are you ready to be the first woman director of player development in the NFL? Mm -hmm. And so that moment, showed me perseverance and how you work through something and how you have to determine what you stand for, who you are, what it is you're hoping to achieve and what you're willing to do to get there. So it's like not about you telling me no or you telling me no, it's me believing that I, I believe there's a yes, right? And so when we think about like there's a lot of weight on all of our shoulders for various reasons, whether it be your communities, your sorority sisters, mm -hmm. uh, college students, your little nieces and nephews, you have a beautiful daughter and mm -hmm. son. Like there is a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. sitting at this table. Like talk a little bit about how you handle that and what message you have to those. What do, what do you say to your beautiful daughter, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, you know, as you were talking and sharing about your experience with um, player development, you know, I started to think about, I've spent a lot of time in nonprofit and a big chunk of that has been centered around youth development. And I think sometimes we underestimate, even though we may think, oh, no one cares about what I'm doing or no one's noticing what I'm doing. But I've found that oftentimes you'd be, you'll be so surprised yeah. at the person that you ha are inspiring, the person that you have impacted, the person who's aspiring to a role like yours. Um, and I never fully saw the value in that until I had a daughter. And then once I had a daughter, you know, I would work with young women and they would ask me about, oh, Ms. Jahar, you, you, you're an executive director? Like, wow, like I wanna be that. And I'm like, that was just a job for me. <laughs> like I didn't realize that it was, that I didn't realize that people were watching. And so I think that is the one thing that I always constantly remind myself mm -hmm. that someone is watching. Yeah. Um, Valeria, you mentioned this about being an example and that you're, we're paving the way for the next set of women yeah. who are coming. and. That is something that I always try to remind myself is that someone's watching, you're paving the way for someone else, you're kicking down a door for the next woman, for the next black little girl that needs to, that wants to work in sports. Um, and so I try to go approach everything with this mentality of, I want the next little black or brown girl to be able to say, I'm here because a Tina yeah, knocked down this absolutely. door, a Brianna kicked over this barrier, or because an Amy Adams Strunk, you know, was the first woman. Whatever it may be, I, I want 
to be able to leave that legacy. I want to be able to leave that notion with black and brown little girls of, you can be the next. Mm -hmm. Like, I may be the first, but there's always a next after me. And I want you to be that next. Mm -hmm. And I want you to learn from what I did and come in 10 times better, be the next badass in this yeah. role. Um, and even for my daughter, you know, who knows if she'll work in sports or even if she'll... <laughs> Love sports she the way that sports. I do. Yeah, yeah she, no, she does not know. care. <laughs> son, yes, daughter Son, yes, daughter, no. <laughs> but I do want her to think of her mother as someone who, like you said, never accepted a no, but also found, the, found a way to encourage herself and use that confidence to say, you know what? I can do this. I can be X. I can be X. I can't. Whatever she aspires to be, and to know, to not let that imposter syndrome yes. sink in, and yeah. to find ways when those little voices do creep in, to find ways to negate that and yeah. say, you know what? Nope, I'm not listening to that, or I'm not listening to the person that's mm -hmm. trying to tell me no. Yeah, it's so funny because when I was, you know, raising my son, it was mm -hmm. very similar. It was like, how do you teach him to have the confidence he needs to be what he wants to be? when he sees things that aren't right mm -hmm. and you accept them. Right. So you have to like, like in that moment to that whole parenting aspect of it, I had to change my mindset mm -hmm. um, to make sure that I was showing him how to be confidently whoever he was. You guys may have heard me use the phrase, train him how to treat you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I say it now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. a lot, yeah. That is like, it's not, it's that, that phrase was very just, authentically created when I finally realized who I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because I'm trying to be somebody and you will respect me a certain way. It was more so I finally have what it takes to respect myself this way. Yeah. And I'm going to give you your respect and all I ask is the same in return. Mm -hmm. And so I'm training you how to be better at treating people the way I want to be treated and I, the way I'm going to give you what I'm going to give you in return. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're talking about like oftentimes you don't necessarily see that people are paying attention. It reminded me, my son's, um, when he was in college, he was trying to figure out what he wanted to do with the rest of his life and didn't want his mom who worked in sports to influence that. And I'm like, I can help you. He's like, no, nah, I'm good. Uh, <laughs> and so he had gone to his academic advisor and he was talking to her about it. And uh, he kept saying to her like, but my mom could help me and I, won't, I don't want my mom to help me. And, and so finally she goes, well, who is your mom? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, who are you? <laughs> and he goes, my mom works for the Titans. She's Tina. And he goes, and she goes, Tuggle? Your mom is Tina Tuggle? And he's like, yeah. She goes, I was a student at University of Alabama. I tried to get, I wrote my final paper on her. Like, I love your mom. And his, he comes back with like, I can't get away from you. <laughs> like, I'm trying to be my own person. But your story is always far reaching. And it was in those moments that you realize like, yeah. as small yeah. as you might feel, you're larger than you think right. you are, you know? I, I think it's the education factor of of people just knowing they have a safe space in sports. I was reading something the other day, and um, in my role as sales, black women are the most un underrepresented in, in that industry and in that department. And so you think of a male-dominated space, and then you take another layer of the onion, and, it, and it's still, you know, even, even less than, um, in a sense. And so... I think about it, how many, how many black women are looking at a job application and they're reluctant to apply mm -hmm. because they haven't connected dots of maybe someone who's in that role. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's where your stories that you shared of, you know, connecting the dots and having someone that you can relate to and, and that inspires you is so critical because there's a lot of people not taking the leap of faith because they don't think they have a place here. But I'll also add to that, Brianna, also feeling empowered because even in this circle, I know that there have been times where I've, I'll use Valeria as an example, <laughs> where I've had conversations with Valeria and I'm like, I don't think I can do that because 
I'm black, I'm this, I'm that, whatever. And Valeria's like, no. <laughs> Look yourself in the mirror. No, she's and probably like, is, no. No, and this is what you're, you're going to walk into his office and this is what you're going to say. Together. Yeah, she, she, yeah, she's like, where's your PowerPoint, Jahar? And so Put I... Put speech with yeah, y'all. <laughs> and she's like, get yourself together because you deserve this and you are qualified. And But you need people in your life, oh, yeah. in your circle that especially other black women who understand what that struggle looks like, you need people in your circle to be able to say to you, no, stop talking down on yourself. Yeah. This is who you are. You possess all of the qualifications and you, in the words of Beyonce, <laughs> pay me, you deserve, she has another word before that, but I left that out. But you deserve all of those things and you don't have to limit yourself or make yourself small because you're afraid that you're going to be perceived as too big. Yeah. So being mindful of that and putting people in your circle who are able to speak life and empower mm -hmm. you in that sense um, that goes a very, very long way when you talk about how do you overcome those adversities. Yeah. And even the one thing I will say is oftentimes when you're in a position to your point, Valeria, like I've been here as long as I have and there's still so much learning to do. Mm -hmm. And so you never really arrive. Like I don't, right. I don't believe there's a, here doesn't exist. You're always <laughs> well, like, you're, you're just <laughs> constantly chopping wood and trying to get there. And it's a hamster wheel. <laughs> it's a hamster wheel. <laughs> but you oftentimes need somebody to look over that hamster wheel and be like, am I doing it right? Yeah. Am I heading in the right direction? <laughs> because it's, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> you are not, but just keep going eventually. <laughs> but it's really like, it's really fulfilling to be able to have have those conversations mm -hmm. and to have those people. Um, I will tell you, I never forget when when Amy took over the organization. I was so excited because I was like, "It is a woman!" Like yeah. we got to Like I told everybody with ears, they're like, "We know, yeah. <laughs> we can <laughs> we see can it." See. But it was like also very motivating, mm -hmm. also very encouraging mm -hmm. to see someone and and she took it and she owned it and yeah. she had to be kind of like a lot of the stuff that many of us are talking about. She was a minority woman in that room. Yes. And so that adversity is like, like far reaching. And yeah. I think um, I learned a lot from her seeing her start to where she is today yeah. and that level of confidence that she has in the position and the power yeah. that she holds. And I think that's, I think that's something we can all do regardless of the level or how long we've been mm -hmm. within the organization. Like we can all own those things. Um, I guess what if you're talking to a young lady, um, whether you know what 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 advice are you giving her? You're talking to young Valeria, yeah. who you know doesn't have this roundtable mm -hmm. conversation mm -hmm. to listen to inspiring stories. Like, what advice are you giving her? Be yourself, and just love that authenticity. When I showed up in the room and applied for many jobs, I showed up representing something that I thought was going to get the job or someone that I thought was going to be accepted and doors <laughs> shut in my face and before I could even reach for the handle. Like, <laughs> like, oh, 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 nope. Almost got my finger now. Oh, oh, oh okay. I'm going over here. You know, like the, the commercial with the State Farm. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't until, and I'll say this, not until I actually got into sport that I started to be recognized and appreciated and valued and started to receive these opportunities because it took that long. I think I had been out of law school almost 10 years. It wow. took that long for me to realize Valeria, show up as Valeria. Yeah. And whoever cannot receive Valeria is not meant to be okay. in Valeria's space. Yeah. And so the minute I realized that I was enough and yeah. I appreciated my backgrounds, my adversity, my obstacles, whatever I brought to the table, even if I didn't have a seat at the table, yeah. that that was enough for me. And so what I would tell my younger self is just be okay with who you are, yeah. love that person and, and bet on her, take risk after yeah. risk and just continue to be authentic. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, well, I was gonna say, I would probably tell <laughs> Little Jahari. Little Joe. Little Joe. <laughs> no, I was, I was teacher's pet. Just all the things. I would probably tell Little Jahari, girl, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Like, yeah. I can recall so many times that I have walked away from opportunities because of fear. Yeah. Because I let fear creep into my head and get all in there and do all the things. Um, and I'm so thankful and fortunate that 
I did not let that happen walking into this opportunity with the Titans, but I would probably tell her, do not be afraid. Do not think that you do not deserve mm -hmm. to be in these spaces, in these rooms, on these platforms, in these orbits, all the things. Yeah. Like, don't be afraid. And to take risk. Um, I think sometimes as, as women, and especially black women, we are, we are positioned or told that we're supposed to get in one lane and stick mm -hmm. to that lane. And when things start opening and start mm -hmm. happening for us, we start to question, like, well, wait a minute. You're not supposed to be over <laughs> there. I, wait a minute. <laughs> like, right. uh, yeah, like, that's not my lane. <laughs> and I'm the only one in that lane. Mm -hmm. So is this really for me? And I think um, we just, we, we get comfortable in thinking that we're supposed to remain low key. Um, and we, we have to get out of our own heads yeah. with that. Yeah. I would agree to both of which, what you're saying. I would tell my younger self, don't hold back. I felt yeah. like I only gave myself 50% of who I am. Yeah. And I, I nicknamed myself a walking minority. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a woman, I'm a black woman and I identify as gay. Yeah. And so I'm like, how much am I being too much? Yeah. Like, so you know, yeah. <laughs> right. what am I gonna be today? Yeah. And, and how much, what percent is yeah, that gonna, gonna be? Yeah. And it's just like, who cares? Like I would- yeah. I, This is who you are, right? And it's okay, yeah. Exactly, right? and there would be times where when, when people got to know me, they're like, oh, we thought you were super reserved. And I'm like, I wish you would see me at home uh, because that's, that's far from the truth. Yeah. And I think I just had to like show up for myself 100% yeah. and not 50, right. not 75, and, yeah. and not just around the, the ladies in the office or, or maybe yeah, some of the guys right. that I got close yeah. with, like show everybody your absolutely. colors, yeah. you know, do it respectfully, of course, but like, don't be afraid to just be 100% Brianna. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if I could rewind, yeah. I would be like, just do it, girl. Yeah. Just, that is yeah. that train them how to treat you. Right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> be authentically you. I yeah. mean, that's what, and I, and the, the, like pivoting just a little bit, this is great, right? We're having this conversation and we can all identify with something that we're all talking about, but in order to move the needle, this is Black History mm. Month. We are talking about being authentically who we are, but the work doesn't just start and end at this table right. with these people. Right. When you're thinking about having conversations that are difficult, whether it be with coworkers, members of the community, mm -hmm. when you're talking to you know ticket holders, like oftentimes there is, whether it be microaggressions or there are times yeah. where the conversations turn difficult. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about navigating that, like in a way that's a respectful, but being true to who you are and not hiding behind being afraid to have those difficult conversations? I mean, I'll start. I think, you know, so I, a lot of, in my role, um, I've spent a lot of time working on the new stadium right. and talking to community members about the new stadium and what that means and how it could be a great impact. Um, and through a lot of those conversations, of course, you know, there are a lot of disparities in our city, mm -hmm. um, whether it's housing, education, you name it, right. transportation, yeah. all the things. Um, and especially when you start to talk about the effects for black and brown mm -hmm. people. Um, and so there are a lot of tough conversations that I have to have. Um, and you know, I, when I started with the Titans, I came in, I drank all the Kool-Aid. I was like, <laughs> blew me up y'all, yes. <laughs> Two tone all the way, um, <laughs> and some so, blue, two tone blue <laughs> all the way. But I think you know when you talk about having hard conversations and being realistic and being um, genuine and really trying to think about what that means for the people outside of these four walls, like people who have never gone to a Titans game or who have never experienced what it's like to work for an NFL franchise team. I really had to think about, in my role, in my position, how can I be of service to someone else who has no affiliation with the Titans? Regardless if they come to a game or not, how can I use my role 
to move that needle forward? How can I use my role to have a greater impact, but to really connect people to genuinely what we stand for as an organization? Um, and that's tough because when you are a minority and you work in spaces like we do, oftentimes people look at us like, mm, yeah. whatever, yeah. like, you know. Oh, yeah. And so you have to really find the space of like, no, let me connect you to yeah. the good things that mm -hmm. we're doing here as an organization. Let me, let me really inform you, educate you, let me try my best to connect you with some of the things that we are happening, that we are doing from a perspective of, we genuinely want to show up for our communities. Yeah. But I also, on the flip side of that, I also recognize that I can't sit silent at the table. When I'm in these rooms yeah, no. with our senior leadership, when I'm in the rooms with other department heads or just our folks who do all the things that they do, I have to make sure that I'm using my voice and speaking on behalf of, you know, of the communities that I serve and really using that as a privilege and considering that to be a privilege, a privilege and thinking about all of the ways that we show up in the community. How can I help us do more and be more? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's a it's a heavy, a heavy, heavy load to bear. Mm -hmm. However, I know that um, we've all been put here to really think about like the next black lawyer that we can hire, the next, you know, how can we open up these floodgates? How can we open up doors and pave ways for, um, for us to show up for black and brown communities in a more impactful way? Yeah, and those conversations can be challenging. It can be challenging. They can be, you know, they can force you to think beyond just yourself. I'll, I've, mm -hmm. had, I've had to have conversations and then I would go home and say, I wish I would have said it this yeah. way, oh. you know. But, but in that, not being afraid to go back and say, and back. hey, yeah. I know we talked about this two days ago, but. <laughs> no, let me text you right now. <laughs> yeah. let, me, let, me, let me put this on your radar yeah. so we can revisit, because yeah. I think that's the hard part too. And I think having a certain level of comfort, right? Yeah. It's, it's, as long as it's coming from the right place, yes. right. Is, that's very important, because you can't, I, I've always believed that if, I, if I'm angry when I try to express something to you, all you hear is my anger. Mm -hmm. So how do I have that conversation with you so that you can hear the message and not the delivery mm -hmm. of the message? Yeah. And I was even having a conversation in my office with two white coworkers and they were asking me things. And because I know that they were coming from the place of understanding, oftentimes I would, you know, I asked the last panel, the last uh, round table uh, participants, does it sometimes feel like it's too much? It's too, it's too hard being black. <laughs> it's too hard being a black woman. It's too hard being a woman in a, a male dominated industry. Like, yeah. do you ever feel that? And, and when you do, what gets you from that place to a place that you're better or okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You've got other areas too, right. you know? Right, no, it is challenging. And you both mentioned it, it's like, the delivery and sometimes, you know, you have to realize there are folks that may not have the same perceptions and experiences and immediately you come in attack mode and you're like, why? But then also there was a time earlier in my career where I was enabling it by not speaking up. Yeah. And I got to a point recently where I was like, I'm gonna speak up because I'm, I'm then becoming part of the problem. Right and it's the way you deliver it. And it's maybe like, hey, what you said upset me, or maybe how I came off was aggressive or attacking, yeah. and I apologize for that, but let me explain why. why. Yeah. And maybe yeah. you can explain what your initial thought was. Yeah. And it's just being able to own up and say, let's communicate yeah. about whatever it is that maybe we both felt triggered by, yeah. for lack of a better word. And it's tough sometimes, I, you know, I look around me and there's only one of me and I feel like I'm on a, on a lonely island. But then I remember like, okay, if there becomes an opportunity for me to connect, I'm going to advocate for that person. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be honest, I look around and say, you know, we need some diversity because a lot of times that's going to help us grow to where we're getting, you know, wanting to go. Yeah. And, and the lack thereof is just slowing down the process. Mm -hmm. So until we can start changing things and, and growing in that nature, we're gonna stay stagnant. Yeah. Yeah. I, I jokingly 
say this all the time because I am I'm biracial, so I'm Hispanic and <laughs> you say it all the time. And <laughs> black. I say it all the time. So there are all the times like that I'm that like, that night. Know, <laughs> like, Well there are all the times that I'm like, mm mm, I'm trading myself. I'm going over <laughs> to the Hispanic delegation now. I'm going over here to this side. But but in those moments where I get frustrated and I'm over it, I think it goes back to remembering my commitment. <laughs> yeah. And you know, sometimes you kind of lay in the bed and you're like, Ugh, I got to get up again and do this. But I made this commitment and I'm a community advocate and I'm all about community. I'm for the people. I'm for the people. <laughs> I am for the people. And so looking yourself in the mirror and saying, oh, you gosh. are for the people. You are like, for the people, girl. <laughs> don't forget it. So just having those moments of reminding myself, but also extending grace yeah. to That's myself. Right. Because we're also yeah. not monoliths. So, yeah. you know. And extending grace to others. To others. Right. Because you, if, if we often only think about them coming from a hurtful place, we respond right. with hurt. Yes. So oftentimes it's like we all have a responsibility to lift mm -hmm. each other up and help each other in this process. Right. And so, you know, when I, my, my younger self, I would say, if you ask me something stupid, I'm gonna give you a stupid response, <laughs> right? What, younger self? Younger as, that was, I was younger yesterday. Last week. <laughs> but my mature self yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> says, how can I help move the needle? How can I help? I walk away better and that person walks away better. Right. Right. And Absolutely. so, you know, it's it's that responsibility we all have, not just as black women, but just as like humans. Mm -hmm. Like we have a responsibility to each other to help each other grow. Yeah. Um, so I just, um, again, I'm grateful for all of you. Mm -hmm. This just warms my heart to be able to be here with black ladies with ladies. There was that, you know, whether it be black ladies or ladies, we were the minority, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now there is a voice. There is, there is sisterhood. There's mm -hmm. like Shannon talked about the professional women's network and she mm -hmm. talked about the, the black ERG and having those opportunities to grow together. It just means so much. So thank you so much for thank participating. You. And thank you. Yeah, it's been great. <laughs>